It's a pleasure to once again introduce uh, John Allison. John, I think you just have to start talking. Thank you, David. Again, my name is John Allison. Uh, I am nothing more than a very amateur historian among a whole lot of professionals here who are really good, published, and great scholars. And uh, I have had the privilege over many years of knowing a good many people in here and also of being able to locate and find some lost battlefields or battlefields and revolutionary war sites that were not very well known and defining them properly. Uh, and I'm going to talk today about the Battle of Buford, which is something we did a few years ago. I've only really spoken about this a couple of times, and I redid this presentation because I, I wanted to concentrate on some things here that I've not concentrated on before. Uh, you know, when you start looking for a battlefield and you find it, and so many scholars, I think, it's not a mistake by scholar, but I, I think it's, it, it's sometimes in the wrong direction. They're, it's sort of like looking at a, a play that a coach draws up on a, on a blackboard for, uh, for football. You know, you're looking at all the X's and the O's, and you're looking where things went, and who moved where, and who did what, but you don't look really at the who. So I'm going to talk today about the what, what happened there first. We had to figure that out before we could figure out where the battle occurred. The second thing is where it occurred, and the third thing is who these people were that were involved here, because when I got involved with this, I started reading some of the names and fig trying to figure out what happened and who the players were, and I was shocked at the cast of characters involved in this battle. And I just think it's something that needs to be shared. Uh, as uh, Charles Baxter was mentioning yesterday, you know, we, we need to know more about who these people are on both sides because they, they help tell the whole story. Now again, my job really was where it is, and I'm going to get involved with that. But this is a Cliff Notes version, folks. I can't talk for the next 45 minutes comfortably without well, looking at these notes on what happened here. And I can talk for 40, 45 minutes on where it happened, and I can talk for 40, 45 minutes on who was there. And you don't want to hear me talk even 45 minutes. So with that said, this is a Cliff Notes version. I apologize if I go a little bit fast, and I'm gonna skip over some things I normally would talk about if I were only talking about one of these three, uh, one of these three uh, subjects. Now, finding the Battle of Buford, you know, when I started looking at this, a good sub, oh, sorry. A good subtitle for this would be Patriot Heroes, British Looters, and French Traitors, because they're all in there somewhere, and we're going to talk about them. Now, to set this up, I'm going to use an old map. This is the only old map I'm going to use, but I like this map, and I decided to put it in here rather than a modern map, and uh, it's, a, it's a 1779 British map, and it is of the area around Port Royal where the battle occurred. If you look at this, you've got Savannah here. you got Purisburg here. Purisburg is where Lincoln had the Continentals up here, uh, the Southern Continental Army, and down here, Provoge, Brigadier General Provoge had the British. They had taken Savannah at this point. So they had Savannah and they had Augusta up here, and in the middle here, 18 miles above Savannah, up the river is Purisburg, where Benjamin Lincoln is. This is Hilton Head. This is Defusky. This is Port Royal. This is the Broad River on the west side. This is St. Helena Sound, which is where the Combi and the Chihal River feed into the Atlantic Ocean. This is Well Branch up here. Now I'm gonna talk more about this later and, and, and really put this on a modern map to show you, but uh, right here is Buford and right down here is, uh, is uh, Fort Littleton. So we've got Provo and Savannah and we've got Lincoln and Purisburg. Provo decides from Savannah that he is going to uh, send out a, a, on a mission a major gardener down to Port Royal, this whole island here, which is rich in foodstuffs and slaves. Provo had a kind of an inclination to collect things as he went along all during the, all the Savannah Basin. And there's a primary account in 1779 that says that Provo had all of the warehouses in Savannah full of loot and plunder. 
all of them. There's no place to put anything else. He sends Gardner out from Savannah with a flotilla. It's not an armada. They weren't all armed. Only a couple of boats really were armed, and they, and they held 180 regular British soldiers. The rest of the boats with him, and I, we do not know how many, I'm going to guess maybe 18 or 20, there were small boats similar to some of the ones that, uh, that Drew Ruddy uh, showed pictures of yesterday, I think. But we really don't have a good, uh, we have some names of the boats, but we don't have a good uh, accounting of all of them. They were all empty to bring back plunder from the Port Royal area. So he sets out, he sets out on the 26th of January, 1779, and he goes in this direction to Tybee, and he spends one night at Tybee, and then he goes up through here, sounding this, this area here between the Fusky and Hilton Head. He lands on Hilton Head, has a small skirmish there, burns two houses, plunders, but his main object is this area up here, which is full of both rebels and loyalists. And he wants to beat these rebels down, burn their houses, plunder their plantations, and reinforce the fact with the loyalists that the British are around and they will protect you. So he goes, sounds up, he sounds along here and then up the Broad River, and by the 1st of February, he is right up here at a place called Laurel Bay. Now, I'm going to put this on a modern map, and thank you for indulging me with this old map because I love this old map. This is the modern map. And you need to understand the geography here to understand what happened. This is Laurel Bay where he landed. This is now a mostly marine uh, housing down here. And there are Marines here who actually were stationed here and lived there for several years. One is right in front of me. <laughs> Raise your hand. Ed, Ed. It's a, he actually lived on Laurel Bay for a while uh, when he was stationed there. And then this is the Marine, the marine Air Base right over here. And this is Grace Hill, which is still there. It's marked. It's on Highway 21. It is an un unincorporated little area. This is Rubel's Ferry up here, Wells Branch, Broad River. This is Buford right here, modern day Buford. And right down here is right along, right there is the uh, is where Fort Littleton was located. So this is the modern map. And on the first, February 1st, 1779, uh, Gardner with his flotilla came into Laurel Bay and he landed at a place called Talbert's, T-A-L-B-I-R-D-S. Now uh, Talbert was a local loyalist. Matter of fact, Talbert wanted to be sure he was known as a local loyalist because he hung out a white flag so that, so that uh, Gardner would know where to land on, on his plantation. Now I'm going to do a few a few kind of side items here, and one of them I'm going to mention right now, this is interesting. Talbert, if you talk about house divided, you know, Clemson, Mary, South Carolina, USC, and that type thing, well, this was a house divided with Talbert because he had a son, obviously a recalcitrant son, who was a rebel. He fought for the Whigs. And Talbert was a died in the wool loyalist. Right below Talbert was another plantation, and on that was Andre DeVoe, which some of you may have heard of. DeVoe is not part of this story. I wish he were because he's a really in interesting individual. But DeVoe also had a son that fought on the rebel side. Both DeVoe and Talbert. The interesting thing is both of them were killed on the 3rd of February in this fighting on Port Royal Sound. They both lost their rebel sons on that day. The sons were lost? Or the men? Sons were lost. Sons, sons were lost. So they... they Land at Talbert's, they burn Hayward's plantation, one of the Hayward plantations, somewhere in this area. Uh, and then on the 2nd of February, they land, they send a, a, a party of shore again at Laurel Bay, and they burn bull, one of the bull plantations. And they notice, though, as they're as they're burning and looting in this area and picking up foodstuffs and slaves, they notice smoke coming from south of Buford. And they think maybe Buford is on fire. The British think maybe the, the town is on fire that's been set on fire. Well, no, Fort Littleton has been set on fire by Captain John Travell, who is a Frenchman who lived in the Port Royal area, who is the captain of uh, the Royal, Ar excuse me, Continental Artillery, and he's stationed at Fort Littleton. He has set it on fire and deserted it because he knows he is totally outnumbered by the British, and he needs to get off the island as quickly as he can 
He has only eight or nine men with him when he leaves there. Most of them have deserted. Three of them actually desert and go over to the British up at Laurel Bay. So Gardner decides, because he hears that Fort Littleton has been deserted on the evening of the 2nd of February, he decides that he is going to uh, have a war council on one of the, one of the ships. And he's going to have six, six, five of the senior officers, six of them. They vote three to three on either attacking or going and trying to capture Fort uh, Lock uh, Fort Littleton or capture Fort Littleton and also hold Buford. That's not his mission. His mission is to loot, plunder, and have a, a kind of a shock and awe type of uh, uh, relationship with those rebels, those terrible rebels who are all over uh, Port Royal. So he deviates from his original mission at this point and decides he's going to do that. And at 10 p.m. that evening on the 2nd of February, he disembarks 180 British regulars. Now these are not provincials trained by Patrick Ferguson. These are dyed-in-the-wool, red-coated uh, uh, British regulars who are part of three different light companies, two of the 60th Regiment and one of the 16th Regiment. Now these light companies are the best that these regiments have because these are the flankers, these are the fast guys, these are in the best shape physically. And these are the guys that they, he took on the raid from Savannah, hand-picked. So there's 180 of them camping that night outside of Talbert's and at 10 o'clock they disembark and by midnight I'm sure they're probably well, uh, well in, 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 into, uh, uh, into their camp uh, somewhere in this area down here. Little do they know that Benjamin Lincoln from Purisburg sent Brigadier General Moultrie to an area north of this, Sheldon, and then all down to Rupel's Ferry where Brigadier General Stephen Bull is. He sent him down there with a message that the British are on the move and it looks like their target is going to be Fort Royal. So Moultrie decides on February the 2nd, when this looting is going on over here, he decides that he is going to move from Rupel's Ferry to Buford to protect Fort Littleton and protect Buford. Little does he know when he gets to Buford, he finds out that Fort Littleton has been burned and he meets John Deval, Captain Deval, Deval with a few Continentals coming out of Fort Littleton, dragging along with him a two-pounder, uh, a two-pounder count. So we've got Moultrie now down here in Buford, and then on February the 3rd, we have Gardner moving 180 men up to Grays Hill from Laurel Bay and all north of Rubles Ferry. Wanted to be sure that we don't have any crossing by the Continentals or by the militia, the rebel militia, into Port Royal. Now you can kind of guess what's going to happen here because Moultrie gets word that Gardner is up there, and Gardner gets word that Moultrie is down here. Moultrie, by the way, did not go all the way into Buford with his camp. We figured out that the camp was probably around where the VA, uh, the VA cemetery is as you go down 21. Uh, you go right by some beautiful cemetery there on the left. That is about where they camped. They didn't camp all the way down into Buford. So to make a long story short of all this, uh, you can guess what happened. Gardner decided that he is going to take Buford and Fort Littleton, and that was his objective from the evening before. And Moultrie decides that he's not going to allow Gardner and the British to take Buford and Fort, and, uh, Fort, Fort Littleton. So, this is what happens. Moultrie leaves and marches north, and Gardner leaves and marches south. They meet somewhere south of Grays Hill and they fight. The British, 180, line up here at the edge of a swamp. We know that because there are numerous primary accounts that they were in a swamp or at the edge of a swamp. And that and Moultrie is here to the south and he is lined up on a slight uh, sandy ridge. Now this isn't a ridge like say Hopkirk Hill or Grays Hill. Uh, this is just a very small rise. It's very difficult to see it when you're driving down 
uh, US 21. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. But we know that Moultrie formed on a rise and the British formed down here at the edge of a swamp. That's just actually where they met. That's the reason that it ended up that way. Plus, Moultrie beat Gardner there, so he had the privilege of forming up here. Now you can see where our search box here and, and, and that we set up, and you can see that there's an old trailer park back here. There's an Allen AM, AME church here. The church cemetery is here. The, uh, there is right in this corner right here, you'll see it's on LIDAR in a few minutes. There is an outdoor drive-in. There is a flea market right here. There's a manufacturing plant right here for pillows, mainly for commercial reasons. This is owned, part of this area back in, right in here is owned by the county, by Buford County, and the Buford County Animal Shelter is about right there. So this is messy. It even gets messier because all this area right in here is controlled by the U.S. Marine Corps, and they won't let me on their property, obviously, and I don't blame them. But you've got the, uh, the runway from, one of the runways from the U.S. Marine Corps Air Base is, is, right about, is right about here. So, you know, they met, and it, 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 it was a great place until all this development took place, and then it became kind of difficult. But anyway, we'll, we'll get into that in a, at some point in a few minutes. Uh, but they meet and they parlay. Uh, actually, uh, Francis Kinlock, Captain Kinlock, is sent forward by uh, by um, uh, by Moultrie, and he meets none other than Gardner, who has a white handkerchief on the end of a saber. And they meet, and he Gardner informs Kinlock that he has all these British regulars, and that he would move over and let the uh, let Moultrie and the, and the militia pass if they would just leave the island undisturbed. They let them unmolested. They could just leave. And Kenlock supposedly says, and this is in several different uh, uh, accounts, he says, Sir, we have too much British blood in our veins to accede to your proposal or to surrender any post without first fighting for it. So that kind of told Kenlock that, yeah, we're going to have a fight here. And we're not, just going to, we're not going to just roll over. Now, the two things that you have to understand when we start looking at the what in, was involved here, this is important, I think. Uh, the first is, as I said earlier, we know from primary accounts there's a swamp down here, and that's where the British formed. Up here is a sandy, little tiny sandy ridge, and it's fairly clear. So we've got the militia, we've got military Bulls militia forming up here in lines, like the British normally formed. And down here we have the British forming in, in, in an ununiform way, not in lines, behind tree stumps and brush and logs. So this is the opposite of what we read about and learn about. You know, the, the, we, we are, the, the militia, the Patriot militia, are forming like the British. And the British are irregularly formed down here like the Patriots. This is kind of backward. Not only that, this is all militia, never in battle. Never in a battle, ever, until this day. All militia, with the exception of seven men who were with Travell, who manned the two-pounder, who were Continentals from Fort Little. This British unit is, are all British regulars. So you've got all British regulars fighting all the militia, in essence. Kind of you know, I, I, there is a scholar, a very good one, that I was reading, when I was reading about the battle, he states this is the first time in the colonies that this happened. All militia, oops, sorry. Oh, good. All militia versus uh, British regulars. Well, he kind of forgot about Lexington and Concord. So it's not the first time it happened. It was the first time it happened in the South. Or Bunker Hill. Or Bunker Hill, thank you. First time it happened down here. So anyway, uh, the, the outcome of this uh, is, are, are these casualties. The British run out of lead, Moultrie runs out of lead, and as his men pull back, the British are cut to pieces. The British are, let me comment on this for just a second, the British have their cohorn or howitzer here, the two six-pounders which are manned by Charleston, uh, Charleston militia, uh, uh, Charleston militia units. There are two artillery units here, two six-pounders. 
one on each side of the road, and this is Travell. He was over on the right in some uh, in some sparse woods, uh, a wooded area there. Uh, so you've got two pounder, two six pounders, and a four pounder howitzer. The first or second fire by the Patriots disabled this howitzer. Not only that, the howitzer was manned by, or partially manned by, three sailors who were French who had been captured, and at the first fire they ran off. One of them had the matras or the, uh, or, or the matchstick, so they can't fire the cannon regardless. But the timbers have been destroyed, and also the shot that destroyed the timbers disemboweled the house, the horse that Gardner was on. So Gardner was kind of knocked out of um, uh, commission for a few minutes too. And you can imagine your horse being knocked completely from under you, but he was, that, that was one shot. It was either the first or second shot of the, of, of the battle. This is interesting because th these, uh, Travell had 16 rounds. These two had 40 pounds rounds each for these two six pounders. They shot 80 rounds. Most of it was lead case shot. Lead case shot we found all over the place. We thought we would find iron grape shot, but we found no iron shot, which is very different than what we thought we might find. There's a lot of iron shot at places like Camden and a little bit up at Hanging Rock and some certainly at, uh, at, uh, at, at uh, uh, Fort Mott, but we found a lead case shot, lots of it. So they really raped the British with this case shot from this artillery. They also did a great job of standing firm against the British as they came forward and tried to push the American lines back. They stood forward, they stood very, very well against them with the Colleton County Militia on this side, the Charleston Militia and Colleton County Militia on this side, and these two uh, uh, artillery units in the middle. So, this is the outcome. The casualties, the British had 180 engaged, there's only one, uh, primary account I can find which says they had 44 killed and wounded, so we don't know how many killed or wounded, although there were some deserters from the British who told Wiltry, and Wiltry writes this, that they, they thought that at least half of them were killed or wounded, and I think it's probably somewhere north of 50, because they cut them to pieces with that artillery. There were 280 patriots, all militia with the exception of seven uh, serving under Captain Travell, there were nine killed, 24 wounded. I know this is right because we counted them, and there's lots of really good information on this battle, lots of really good primary accounts concerning this battle. So they had a total of 33 versus 44, and probably more than 50 on the British side. Uh, some of the British were cut up more than pretty badly. Sergeant Dor Dornseth, uh, when they got him back to the boats, had his leg amputated, and he was part of the 60th, and also Corporal West, part of the 60th, had his arm amputated, and the next day wrote a song, which I can't quite understand. But anyway, he, obviously he, he was in pretty good spirits after losing an arm. It's so he's not on a banjo though, I bet it. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. So now, now exactly where did this happen? You know, how did we find this? That we went over the what, the where, is, is that, uh, well, let me start with a story here. Uh, then, in 2016, I was at, in 2016, I was at a um, SCAR round table in Abbeville, South Carolina, and Dan Battle, I barely knew Dan, but Dan and his wife Daphne run Crescent Consultants, which is an archeological uh, outfit out of Beaufort, South Carolina. Dan approached me that day and he said, you know, he said, I want, I was wondering if you could help me with something. I thought he wanted to borrow a file or ask me a question. I didn't know what he wanted. And Dan said, I have never been able to find the Battle of Buford. No one has. And everyone's really interested in it at this point. I've had people ask me about it. I don't have any money to go look for it. But I would like to find it. Can you help me find this? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know about the Battle of Buford. I mean, I know that it occurred before the fall of Charleston, but I can't tell you who was there, how many people were there, or anything about it. Let me look at it. So I did, and I thought, well, good Lord, there's plenty of I have lead footprint here to find this thing, but it's not going to be easy to find because it's somewhere on Port Royal. So we had to figure out what happened. We had to figure out which direction these folks went in. We had to figure out where they met or about where they met. Then we started looking at distances. The distances were really important, but more than anything, 
we had a ferry where the Red War Road was. Is this the road? Because we discovered on old maps, there's a ferry here, and there's a ferry over here at one time. At one time, there's a ferry over here where the railroad is. So could this have been the road, or is this the road? It makes a big difference on where we're gonna find this battle. We finally decided, after a lot of debate, and riding around a lot, and I, mean, I know Port Royal pretty well, because I've been all over, the, all over these roads with, with, uh, with battle. So we finally decided this is the old Red War Road. We're gonna make that assumption that this is the Red War Road right here, US 21. Now in making that assumption, we also knew that we had distances that military travel going back north. We had distances that uh, the British travel going south toward Grays Hill. We always, many, and many people thought the battle occurred here at Grays Hill. Well, it really didn't. Some people thought because of the mileage that they had, that they had calculated, it occurred down here at the gate, uh, the main gate of the uh, uh, Marine Air Base. Well, it did, partly because people thought that the British were camped in Buford, they were camped outside of Buford uh, at that uh, veterans uh, cemetery. So, how do we find this thing? Well, we look at the distances, and we know that there's a swamp and a ridge here, as I mentioned earlier. We know that. Uh, that military formed on a slight ridge, and we know that there's a swamp here where the British formed. And thank goodness Charles Baxley got us a really good LIDAR map, which I want to apologize for this. I can't blow this up. I could blow this up, I could make it more sense, I could make more sense out of it. We don't have time. I'd like to do two or three larger and smaller pictures of this. I took a snippet of it. This is not even the whole map. But th this is the LIDAR. And we started looking from Grace Hill South because we knew it had to be somewhere near Grace Hill but we knew it had to be south of Grace Hill, down toward the Marine Air Base. Judging by the distances and the topography, we thought that's where it was. And we had to come up with a search box on where to search. We first looked right in here, because there's a swamp right here on the LIDAR. There's also a swamp, believe it or not, right here. It's a much lesser swamp and smaller. But these are two holding ponds. There's another holding pond over here, and there's a real swampy area right back in here. Uh, you can see it from the road. So this is US 21, and this is where the uh, 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 trailer park was. And you can see, as I said earlier, you can see the outline of the drive-in theater right here. So we decided, well, maybe this is the swamp and not this one. We found nothing in this area right in here, with permission from a gentleman who lived right here. So we got permission to look on Mr. Clean's property right here, just south of the pillow factory, which is look vacant and didn't look disturbed. Uh, he runs a trucking company in downtown Buford. I talked to him, he could not have been a monster guy, he and his wife. So Dan Battle went out one day and he called me breathless from the field and said, you never believe this, I've been out here for 40 minutes, I found five musket balls. He said, I found, I found, I said, then stop. Don't do anything else until we can put together a crew, we can put a, to define a, um, a search box and we can start looking for this. So I took a crew down very shortly after that from Columbia, four of my guys, plus myself, plus Dan Battle, plus Dan Elliott from Lamar Institute, some of you may know him, very fine archeologist came over and helped us, plus another archeologist from Western Georgia came over because he heard about this. So there were eight of us in the field for two and a half days, or two days, and most of us were two and a half. And we found a huge amount of shot in this area right in here, in a swamp and up toward the, the pillow factory. When I say huge, I mean like 50, 60 shot. I don't mean five, 600. But then you, know, you can only do so much because it's not a very big area. And also it's so overgrown and swampy as can be down in here. And also on this side, you've got the, you can see that this is, um, this is one of the runways right here at the Marine Air Base. So you've got the Marine Air Base all in here. So there's really not much room that we have to look, but we did get permission from uh, I got permission from uh, the count, uh, Buford County to look this area back here where the animal shelter is and uh, we found some stuff back, that far back also which helped us to find this whole battle. So we found the battle. Now we were really lucky because Charles Baxter get, got this LIDAR for us and um, we found it real quickly. Normally this takes me two or three years to find something. I keep going back and going back and doing more research and looking uh, and, and sometimes people get real, uh, they get real fatigued with going with me because uh, you know, you're just not finding anything. Well, we got lucky here, and I've always said I'd much rather be lucky than handsome, and God bless me in that respect here today. <laughs> so, 
Anyway, this is where it occurred. John, question. Hitting the battle, hitting the marker for the Battle of Fort Royal at the intersection of 21 and the... It, I think it's right up here somewhere. Okay. It's about a quarter and a half mile away, five and a half mile away. Who, who determined that that sign should go there? I don't know. Because it is I don't know. I've asked those questions for 25 years. But it's, it's close to where you're saying it is. It, it's about half a mile away. Yeah. But it, it doesn't say the Battle of Prudence. It says near here. Okay. Because they don't know. Yeah, and, and that was put there a long time ago. Yes, a while. I, well, I don't know when it was put there, but it was, it was, I'm sure it was a good while ago, yeah. yes. But yeah, it's fairly close, but it is not at the battle site. I mean, we didn't know. We didn't, for all we knew, it was at the mark. Sure. And we just had to figure this out. But yeah, the mark, I say the mark's half a mile away north of that toward Grace Hill on the uh, west side of the road. Okay. Yeah, but you're right. So this is what it looks like. We knew exactly where people stood. We knew exactly where the cannon were. This is, this is the Patriot line right here. This is the um, uh, British line right here. This is the swamp. They came through the swamp. They were on the ridge. Pillow factory's right, right, Pillow factory's actually right there. And there's a flea market right here. Here's the uh, drive-in theater. Uh, here's the halfway house, what we think is a halfway house. Certainly it was a house back there because the British kept writing that they were taking their wounded back to this house 200 yards behind their lines. And that makes sense. And we found a house with lots of old 19th century and a few 17th, uh, 18th century artifacts around it back here. Uh, the house is no longer there. The foundation isn't there. We found enough artifacts and enough to tell us that yes, there was definitely a house back there. So we think that's the house where they took some of their wounded uh, as the battle uh, transpired. So if you find the artifacts, you know where people stood. Like David Ruhr said yesterday, it's archival, anecdotal, and archaeological. You can look at the first two A's, you think you got it, but the third A, that archaeology, defines it and tells you where it is. So if you want to go to the site, if you go to Grace Hill, which is an unincorporated area, but there's a sign there, it's a slight hill that goes up and then down, there are not many hills on, on Port Royal. It's pretty flat. You go to Grace Hill, you go one mile south from Grace Hill, you turn, all you have to do is go to the Shell Station in the southwestern corner of Clarendon Road and Grace Hill. If you turn out, go one mile south, and you end up about right there. And that's where the battle occurred. You will be right on the British lines if you go one mile south looking at the American lines up a slight hill. That's where the battle is. You can write that down, you can look at it tomorrow if, if you're in the Buford area, because that's where it's located. Now, We've talked about the what and the where. I want to cover real quickly the who because I think this is extremely important. Uh, if I told you, if I told you that there's a movie coming out and it's going to star Harrison Ford, Kevin Costner, Mel Gibson, Matthew McConaughey, and supporting cast is going to be Samuel L. Jackson and Matt Damon, <laughs> would you go see it? Probably. I mean, any of those are stars. You go see it because of one of those, maybe two. What if I told you all of them? When I started looking at this battle, that's what I found in the cast of characters. And I think you're going to agree with it. I mean, you don't see those modern actors. Uh, and what I'm going to show you in a second, but you see some people who are, I think, just as interesting and very deserved of our attention because of what they did during the Revolutionary War. And the first one is General William Moultrie. It takes no introduction from Moultrie. 1776. Fort Sullivan, hero, Brigadier General. He is the last, the last individual promoted during the Revolutionary War in the Continental Army to Major General. The last one, because he was a Major General by the end of the war. Captured, unfortunately captured when Charleston fell. But he is in command here because he's senior to Stephen Bull. Brigadier General Stephen Bull. This is not Stephen Bull's picture. I, it's the closest I can find. I can't find a picture of him anywhere. This is his son, uh, a portrait done in 1809. So I think he probably looked a little like this. Certainly didn't have a military uniform on. But Stephen Bull was interesting because his uncle, William Bull, which Charles mentioned yesterday when he was talking, William Bull was the acting governor, royal governor of South Carolina in the governor's absence at one point, and was a lieutenant governor of South Carolina, a royal governor. So. Uh, Stephen Bull was sort of like the Tal the Talbert son from the Talbert, the Talberts, and also from uh, from uh, Andre Devoe. Uh, he was a 
a staunch Whig. He was a staunch rebel. But his family were all loyalists, which created some problems for him in later life. He and his brother both were patriots, but the rest of the family were not. They were all loyalists. And then there's the captain of the Buford Horse, Captain John Barnwell, which a lot of you will recognize that name. Now, again, this is just a militia dragoon, because I cannot find a picture of John Barnwell anywhere, anywhere, anywhere either. I don't, want to, I don't want to talk about him for a second. Because of his actions this day at the Battle of Buford, he was promoted from captain to major. He ends up being a brigadier general in 1783. He is head of all of the South Carolina militia. So a, a, a very storied um, uh, service uh, during the revolution. Now, this is what amazed me when I looked at this. You remember I said there were two Charleston artillery companies there? They were commanded by two captains. One is Captain Edward Rutledge, the other one is Captain Thomas Haywood. Now, does anybody recognize these names? Yeah. Two signers of the Declaration of Independence were at this battle. And they weren't just at the battle in the background, they fought. They commanded artillery com companies which cut the British to pieces. Both of these guys did. The youngest signer of the Declaration of Independence, right there at age 26, was at this battle as a captain. 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 12 of the 56 fought sometime during the Revolution. This is two of the 12, and I can't find, and please help me if you find it, because I'd like to know, I can't find anywhere where two signers of the Declaration of Independence fought together in the same battle. And these guys are right beside each other, one on one side of the road, one on the other, two six-pounders, Charleston artillery. So who in here has ever heard of Jim Capers? Raise your hand, David. You don't count because you, you're not talking about it. <laughs> who, who, it see, anybody ever heard of Jim Cable? You're going to hear about him now. Because when I found out about this, and I started researching it, this is such an interesting individual. There's a painting done by Jeff Trexler, which is, I think, a great painting. I don't really, I think he did a great job of researching it. And this is of the Battle of Buford. Now, this has been done since we did our work there and found it. And you'll see up here is. Moultrie supposedly, and this is supposedly, I would imagine, John Marvel. Here are the, here's the battery right here, the two six-pounders. Put it back over here somewhere. And this battle is going on and people are being wounded and standing right here is an African-American drummer named Jim Capers. Now, I have apologized to Carol and, and, and to George several times about coming down here and speaking previous to this and not having something marion centered because I always want something, and I just don't have anything Marion said. One day I will. One day we'll be on a site for Marion, and I'll be really excited and be able to come down here and talk about Marion. But I just don't, except that this is Marion centric, and I'll show you why in a second. Because Jim Paper served under Marion, but he also served and initially um, was uh, enlisted in the South Carolina 4th Regiment, 4th Continental Regiment. And this is his pension, thanks to people like Leon Harris. This is his pension statement right here. He enlisted in the 4th South Carolina Regiment as a drum major. He was at the Battle of Buford, which we know. And by the way, this is his pension statement stating this. The Battle of Savannah is at the surrender of Charleston when the 4th was captured and they were dissolved at that point. So who did he fall in with? Francis Marion's militia. He was a drummer with Francis Marion's militia for the rest of the war. After the surrender of Charleston, he says that he was with Marion's militia at the Battle of Camden. Well, thank goodness. He's made a mistake there. He probably was with Marion prior to the Battle of Camden when Marion was running around with Gates prior to the Battle of Camden. But thank goodness Gates sent Marion off on a scout, and I'm sure that that's what happened with uh, with our friend Jim Capers. He left with Marion, and if they had been there, they might have been killed and certainly could have been, could have been captured because that was a complete disaster at Gates' defeat. But anyway, he says Marion's militia at Battle of Camden. Uh, Marion wasn't at Battle of Camden, but I'm sure he was there with Gates prior to that. He said he also mentions the skirmish. He was at the skirmish at Biggin Church. Well, there was a skirmish at Biggin Church on the 16th of July, but the next day there was a, a fight at Schubert's. 